Good afternoon. Boa tarde. Bem-vindos e bem-vindas. Welcome to the Brazil Lab event on artifacts, image, agency, and ritual in Amazonia. My name is João Bill. I teach anthropology here at Princeton University, and I'm the director of the Brazil Lab at the Princeton Institute for International and Regional Studies. This has indeed been a most brutal week. After the tragic flooding that took hundreds of lives in Brazil, early in the week, we got the devastating news about the passing of our good friend, the visionary medical anthropologist and physician, Paul Farmer, one of the world's brightest lights and a champion of the right to healthcare and the fight against structural violence throughout the Americas and in the African continent. I also want to express our outrage with Russia's ruthless invasion of Ukraine, which is taking place as we meet here, and express our deep solidarity with Ukrainian people. Our event today is centered on indigenous resistance and the otherwise. It celebrates the most recent book of Carlos Fausto, a world-renowned reference in Amerindian studies and a great friend of the Brazil Lab. Carlos is a professor of anthropology at Brazil's Museu Nacional and a Pierce Brazil Lab Global Scholar and Artifacts is part of his long durée study of indigenous world makings. Carlos is a recipient of numerous awards and the author and co-editor of several books, including Warfare, Warfare and Shamanism in Amazonia and Time and Memory in Indigenous Amazonia. Deeply committed to artistic collaborations, Carlos also co-directed the prize-winning film, The Hyper Woman, together with Takuma Kuikuru and Leonardo Setti. Carlos has been the lifeline of the lab's recently created research hub, engaging indigenous ecologies of knowledges, and we are so happy to have him here at Princeton, where he's co-teaching this term, Insurgent Indigenous Arts. Thank you, Carlos, for being here and for all you do. To engage with Carlos's trailblazing work, we are fortunate to have two incredible Princeton scholars with us today. Juliana Dweck is chief curator at the Princeton University Art Museum. She earned her PhD in social anthropology from Cambridge University. Juliana has recently co-curated the exhibitions Surfaces Seen and Unseen, African Art at Princeton, and Miracles on the Border, Retablos of Mexican Migrants to the United States here at Princeton. Agustin Fuentes is professor of anthropology at Princeton. He is an active public scientist and has published extensively on evolutionary theory, multispecies anthropology, and race and gender. Agustin's most recent books include Why We Believe, Evolution and the Human Way of Being, and The Creative Spark, How Imagination Made Humans Exceptional. Thank you all for joining us here today. This is our format. Carlos will speak, he told me, for about seven minutes about the Art Effects project. We will then hear from Juliana and then Augustine. Carlos will reply to each one of their commentaries. And to wrap up, we will engage with questions from the audience. For the audience watching from home, the chat on our YouTube channel is open. So please feel free to ask questions as the event unfolds. Our team will be collecting your messages and will forward them to me. I will then pass them on to our speakers. Our event will end sharply at 1 p.m. Thank you all for being here today. Carlos, the screen is yours. Thank you, Juan. I'll be very economical in my thankings to keep on the seven minutes, not more than that, but I would like to thank and express my gratitude to the Brazil Lab and Joan uh, uh, for organizing this event, and Juliana and Agustin for having accepted to debate my book, which is a great honor for me. So let me briefly, very briefly, introduce artifacts to you, I mean to the audience, by summarizing some of its main questions and contributions. I conceived artifacts as an ethnographic and theoretical experiment in which I strive to articulate dense interpretations of Amerindian ethnographic materials with different levels and styles of comparison. Such articulation serves my goal of addressing 
a number of theoretical issues in the anthropology of art, ritual, and religion in close dialogue with art history and philosophy. The book revolves around the relation between persons and things, addressing issues concerning the agency of artifacts, the genesis of presence, and the question of belief. These three issues are closely interconnected and are part of a long tradition in Western thinking marked by a particular anxiety about the relation between representation and presence, sign and world, image and prototype. In Artifacts, I propose a new reading of these issues and of its recent developments in anthropology. In writing the book, I had to make some choices. One was the decision to privilege the aesthetic and pragmatic levels, resorting to ontological arguments only in support of some analysis, not as their alpha or omega. If my emphasis is on form and action, especially ritual actions, this is because my intent is to study the interconnections between the formal conventions and the pragmatic mechanisms through which images become effective and engender extraordinary beings, humans who become jaguars, artifacts that speak, words that cure, and so on. My main goal is to describe when, how, in what context, and under what conditions an artifact is a person, a representation convokes a presence, or an object acts. I'm particularly interested in the contextual triggering of diverse ontological and epistemological modalities in the same ritual event. To achieve this goal, I tried to avoid falling back into the pendular motion between presence and representation, as well as into our obsession with the sign thing metric. I moved away from the notion of belief to explore the idea of a constitutive uncertainty that triggers imaginative and cognitive projections thus convoking an expected but never assured presence. And here I draw, as you all, <laughs> all know, on Alfred Gell's concept of abduction of agency and Carlos Severi's concept of capturing imagination as both strive to make sense of the mystery of animation. Why do people respond to some images in some contexts as if they were alive? Where does reside the animation of an object image? Art historians such as David Friedberg and Hans Belting associated to a universal human response when confronted to the similitude of the image. For them, likeness is presence. Anthropologists such as Descola and Viveiro de Castro, on the contrary, see it as resulting from a specific animistic ontology. In analyzing Amerindian artifacts or art effects in ritual contexts, I tried to complexify both positions. Firstly, I suggest that our revisited concepts of animism per se does not account for the animation of image, which must be empirically and contextually analyzed. I additionally suggest that though the new animism effectively challenges anthropocentrism and allows the expansion of the concept of humanity beyond the human species, it remains anthropomorphic and dependent on the body-soul duality, something that my analysis of ritual artifacts contradict. Secondly, I show that the obsession with mimetic evocation very similitude in the West resulted from a very specific path taken many centuries ago in close association with a certain notion of truth. The quest for correspondence <clears throat> suppose an unequivocal relation between prototype and image, which was constantly threatened by ambiguity and transformation. As I argue in the conclusion of the book, the hegemonic response of Christianity to this problem led to a radical anthropomorphizing and stabilization of the divine, constructed in opposition to the metamorphic character of the devil. One of my core arguments in artifacts is that Amerindian visual regimes took a different path. Its problem was never very similitude or the imitation of the human form, but on the contrary, 
how to figure transformation and the multiple character of powerful beings. These required a, a, an aesthetics of tricksters, true masters of deceit, not masters of truth and self-same self -same identity. Over the course of the book, I explore a set of formal operations allowing the generation of the type of visual complexity that I deem characteristic of Amerindian arts. In each of the five chapters that compose the book, I focus on one category of artifact, the body, wind instruments, masks, and two kinds of ritual effigies. Detailing the way in which they produce formally and pragmatically the sort of instability that prompts the capture of imagination, generating a quasi-presence. In the background of the book runs a political conceptual operation. As we all know, the association between zoomorphism, categorical instability, and devilish qualities is a common trope in the interpretation of Amerindian iconographies from colonial times to the present. The so-called conquest was saturated with, op with object images, prompting an imagistic war in which Amerindian traditions unfortunately took the worst. To brush this imagistic violence of the past against the grain, I decided in artifacts to estrange our anthropomorphic, mimetic, and figurative tradition in the hope that free from a certain education of the gaze, we might experience the sophisticated ruses of Amerindian arts in all their originality. So basically that's my sum, way of summarizing my arguments in the book. Thank you, Carlos. This is just, you know, fascinating. The book, Artifacts, is just, it's a tour de force, Carlos. And what you just did now is just incredible. I wish we had hours and hours just to <laughs> to listen more from you, you know, the sharpness of the arguments, the way you are setting it up against, you know, so many scales, but also, again, bringing up, you know, what's unique, you know, this, this work on transformation that you see emerging from, um, from, from Amerindian communities and challenging, you know, so many tenets of, of, of Western, you know, epistemology, ontology, and, and, and politics. Thank you, Carlos. Mm -hmm. Juliana. I wish I could reallocate my time to you, Carlos, so that we could continue listening to you, but I will, I will stick to the schedule. Um, Carlos, I've just simply um, absolutely reveled in the richness and intricacy um, of this interdisciplinary comparative ethnography. Um, as someone who thinks about material culture, both from an art historical and anthropological perspectives, I was particularly entranced by the ways you show us how uh, trophies, sacred flutes, dance masks, effigies, all these um, object images in lowland South American societies are hardly just things, um, but rather visual, haptic, olfactory, mobile, uh, acoustic, linguistic, uncertain, but, but very potent artifact bodies. Um, so thank you, uh, Joao, for the invitation. And thank you, Carlos and Augustine, for this conversation today. I believe I was permitted into this discussion because I'm an anthropologist working in an art museum. And naturally when given, uh, given the interlocutors and the manuscripts, I came running, not knowing that things were not necessarily as I expected. What I mean is that in most studies that intermingle anthropology and art history, the usual sort of comfortable shared discourse, um, the overlapping uh, Venn diagrammatic space where the two disciplines happily commingle is usually in the area of representation, as you suggested. We often read about portraits representing individuals or ideal types or objects serving as symbolic portrayals as in totems um, or cases where the signifier takes the form of the sign even when there's not visual likeness. But that is not the case, of course, in artifacts um, because as Carlos shows us, Amerindian arts are not matters of representation. They're not even as David Friedberg redirected us 30 years ago, cases of representations where images are their own reality um, rather than a displaced one. But rather for, for Fausto in the Amerindian context, object images are not about mimesis, but about metamorphosis, not about imitation, but about transformation, um, where images sort of nest within each other, they oscillate rather than imitate. 
And there is, there is one fleeting moment where, Carlos, you do dangle before us in the form of the Quarp effigy um, of the commemorated chief, what we think might be a singular relation between an artifact and a friend, but it's a false alarm. Uh, we learn from the ways that effigies are after the death of a chief uh, ceremonially fabricated, sung, mourned, and finally abandoned, uh, that the effigy may be a double, but it's not mimetic. Because what we might want to call representation is actually actually replication, or at least, or maybe the capacity to be replicated. Um, and what's more, the original was never original or unitary to begin with. Um, and instead, Carlos shows us how notions of, of illusion, paradox, deceit, um, contradiction, are inherent in the activation of object images um, and more broadly in understandings of what it means to be human. So transformation, as you've told us now, is really the critical concept here. Um, and we learned that an Amerindian aesthetics of ambiguous images goes hand in hand with the transformative creativity of the trickster. Um, and the trickster is actually what I'd like to ask you my first question about. Uh, Carlos, you return as a refrain in your book to discussions of the pan-Amerindian figure of Talhi. Uh, the solar master of deceit, this paradoxical self-referential persona, this sort of force of ongoing creative multiplying change. So, so every culture, it seems, has its mythological trickster, some kind of, of transgressive figure who is ontologically uncertain, who escapes containment and categorization. Um, for example, for, for Yoruba in present day Nigeria, um, another culture is interestingly where naturalistic representation of a living person is also treated with ambivalence. Um, for Yoruba, there's the well-known trickster god Eshu, uh, the god of uncertainty, change, malicious, malicious mischief. Um, and of course, he's, he's really a global trickster serving as the Orisha of the crossroads, not only in West and Central Africa, but across the African diaspora um, and in the Americas. He's Eshu in Santeria, in Brazil, he's Elegbara, in Haiti, he is the voodoo god Papa Legba. And in all these manifestations, Eshu is a capricious mediator between the, the spiritual and earthly realms um, with a power that's, that's both creative and destructive. He can bless those who perform rituals properly with good fortune, and he can bring misery to those who do not. Who do not. Um, so what's especially interesting here are the ways that this trickster's ambiguity is not just transitive, but constitutive. Um, to be a trickster is to be multiple rather than unitary. So I wondered if you could tell us a little bit more about the trickster in the Amazonian context um, to understand from you how the trickster explains other things. Um, and specifically, I'd like to hear your thoughts on how the trickster's disorder can serve as a sort of analytical and not just epistemological object. Um, I'm realizing this is less a question than an opportunity to explore. Uh, for example, what would it mean to take a trickster approach to anthropology or ethnography um, with a lens of constitutive disorder rather than say a Western assumption of order or anthropocentrism? Mm -hmm. So that's my first question. Um, and my, my second question, I think they're related, but on the surface at least, my second question is very different um, and it's a museological one. Um, so, so in its broadest sense, the question is, how do you put a recursive chain in a glass case? Um, <laughs> and in other words, I wanted to ask you about the display of masks in museums, um, and even more specifically, to think about how museum displays can reference the ritual states of indeterminacy and ambiguity that you study. So I know, you know, I'll sort of as a given, I know that masks from any culture is just sort of as a baseline are difficult objects to exhibit, even if one gets over the ethical hurdle of whether or not dance masks should be collected or should be displayed at all. Um, sort of to generalize, art museums tend to have an easier time with figural sculpture, um, which is to say sort of things of stillness rather than objects of ritual and performance or things of action. Um, and I presume this is a, a, largely a challenge of contextualization um, since the full ritual entity um, encompasses the material object plus the costume dancer and an assemblage of moves and acts, um, none of the elements being able to stand on their own and only one of which can be put in a glass case. So my question may need to stay in the realm of a hypothetical because I don't know if there are any Kuikuro masks in museum collections or if you would even advocate for that. Um, but, but let's just say a museum has an aga mask, um, which you describe in your book um, wonderfully with its mini face on a triangular wooden, wooden base suspended from an arch structure. Um, and for those of you who have the book handy, there's a good picture on page uh, 152. 
taken in 2006 by the author. Um, and I understand that this mask would have been danced with an extensive musical repertoire. So if through these masks, artists and shamans and ritual performers have found ways to depict metamorphosis using solid matter, then how does one convey in a museum that image, image bodies are doubles in states of continuous transformation in, in ways that go beyond, let's say, beyond the few sentences that could be conveyed in a, in a gallery label? Um, one idea that occurred to me would be to show or, or describe um, a mask wearer wearing body paint under his mask to show, as you say, a second face containing a person within. Um, so I'd love to hear your thoughts and I'll just add um, that I think it's a particular challenge in a museum, an institution founded on the idea of the original, the singular, to in introduce instead a concept of the original as something that is the very capacity to be replicated. Um, so thank you for the opportunity to ask these questions and I look forward to your thoughts. Uh, thank, thank you, you for Juliana, Carlos. Screen is yours. <laughs> okay, thank you. <laughs> Listen, thank you very much for not only the questions, but of uh, you know summarizing parts of the book that I haven't had the opportunity to summarize in my initial talk. I mean, I totally agree with you, and 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 you certainly it was uh, something that uh, comes from in a, in a certain way from Cambridge for both of us. The, you know the and, and Marilyn Stratern's work and 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 so it's obviously heavily dependent my argument on what the person is and the effigy and what is the singularity what is the multiplicity the kind of concept of the person that is uh, 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 ingrained in this context so I, I think this is also a part of the my reaction to see how good it is to share a certain tradition that we can uh, immediately understand each other in, in this regard. Um, the two questions, one about the trickster, the other about museums, which I think it's an incredible question. And I'm starting to think about it, but I haven't uh, done before, but I'll try to, to convey something that makes sense. I, I think that is uh, two things about the trickster that you said. One is, about all other cultures, and you gave the example about the Yoruba and Exu and et cetera. Uh, the question is, I don't know, I, I don't know enough about, for instance, Chinese uh, uh, cosmogony or Japanese, uh, et cetera, to say all of them, because normally, and that's our, the, 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 the limit of our capacity of uh, discussing, uh, we tend to see this in opposition to our own society and as i said in in, a, in another piece we create a inspired in, on marilyn stratern as well uh, we create some fictions of what is our west world to compare and it's it's a, totally i think uh, uh, fair uh, the only thing that that we could start thinking about the possibility in if christ was a trickster what kind of religion would christianity be then, you, then the, this huge difference uh, kind of became really salient, at least for me. And so, uh, of course, and as I say in the, in the introduction, I, in a certain moment, I had thought about comparing, uh, you know, like kind of pluricentric comparison, Western, certain Christian Western tradition, uh, Amerindian tradition, and uh, Central African tradition, but that, that was too much in terms of uh, 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 thinking about this uh, effect. But then there is a methodological or epistemological question that you pose as well. Um, is it possible to take a trickster approach or trickster oriented approach in anthropology in the way we um, analyze or describe or depict the, the, our own uh, uh, work and, 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 the, and the, the task of writing an ethnography about another people? That's a good question because it's a, it's, it's a very, um, it, it's easy to say, look, how beautiful is, uh, you know, this tradition where the trickster occupies a certain place where truth is not taken as, you know, a problem of, True or and false, and but it's it's uh, it's it's different. But then, would you apply that reasoning and that 
example to to the science you make or there is a incompatibility that is impossible to be uh, uh, overstepped I, I think it's a it's a very important question uh, can we decolonize uh, to, to speak like uh, in I was as I'm in America in in the United States so uh, can we decolonize anthropological practice by assuming a trickstery kind of approach uh, I don't know that that's I, I leave uh, the, the question on the board for, for us to discuss further, but very briefly, how to display such, right, not only masks, but the recursive nesting of masks in a museum? Well, difficult. It is really difficult because you would probably think about something like uh, a mimetic evocation of the pragmatic situation there. So, and then you can start doing some kind of modern or contemporary dioramas, you know, like in those in the past with the, the situation, the context. It, I think it should be more radical. It should be, uh, for instance, I talk a little, uh, I, talk, I think when I talk about the flutes, about tubes and, and the, 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 Klein bottles effect. I think it would be more to like displaying them together with these topological complex uh, uh, objects or uh, conceptual artifacts that we have in our own society, rather than uh, doing something more like uh, do give it the context, uh, the way you depict transformation. So, so uh, that's that's my my initial clue, it's like to be more radical in terms of, of. But I would love to have all these operations that I uh, formal operations that I try to work with uh, as a way of thinking about how to display these concepts. This these uh, formal concepts in terms of a museum uh, exhibition. But thank you very much, I don't, I don't have an answer, but I, I start, I'm starting to think in provocative. Well, so that's already an artifact, if I may uh, pun. <laughs> and I, I really thank Juliana for your comments and Carlos for your, you know, for, for your thinking with Juliana's question, which is interesting, it was already an, an effect of the book, of the thoughts, you know, that Juliana just, through back at anthropology itself, but also to herself, which is very fascinating, right? So, so that move of how to be interpolated by that, um, by that transformation that Carlos chronicles, uh, that he learned from and chronicles in the, in the book. Agustin, we want to hear from you now. Thank you for being here, Agustin. Oh, well, thank you, Zhao uh, and Brazil Lab for, for inviting me. And uh, Carlos, thank you for writing just a spectacular book that I kept going back to again and again and again. And I, I have notes for a three-day workshop here, but I'll keep it very <laughs> short. Um, and Juliana, thanks. I, you just said a few things in there that tie almost just beautifully with what, what I have to say. What, what I wanna do is frame just a couple of sort of general comments and then a, a couple of questions that emerge from them. But I wanna approach this maybe in a way that you might not be expecting. And that is as a scholar, as an anthropologist interested in the deep deray the engagement of humans with meaning making over not just historical or contemporary times, but over deep evolutionary times. Uh, my colleague Mark Kissel and I have published over the last uh, five years or so, uh, a number of overviews of the presence of what people like to call art and symbol, which I would actually not like to call either, as I think you might agree, um, but meaning making, evidence of meaning making across the last three or 400,000 years of human evolution. And your writing here resonates amazingly well with some of the impressions that we've, we've received. So the, basically what I'd like to do is sort of set this idea that while reading your book, I, I was reminded again of this critical frame of meaning making as opposed to art and symbol, to, to, to free ourselves to a certain extent, to engage the concepts and practice, not necessarily the definitional context by which meaning making or representation uh, emerges in the human niche. And I think this is important because for me, the human niche is, is a frame. Um, we know biologically and experientially, the skin does not bound the body, just as the material 
and representational does not bound the niche or the imaginary or the possibilities of the human. And I think sometimes we, we don't recognize that in our classic interpretation of representational things that we call art. Um, here I would go, and, and, and as you mentioned, um, uh, you uh, invoke uh, Alfred Gell uh, a number of times, arguing for his discarding of the symbol, right, in the theory of art, and sort of subsuming the icon and index uh, it, together. I would go even one step further and invoke Peirce, who gave us the symbol icon index trichotomy, and even push that trichotomy off the table and replace it with one of Peirce's other trichotomies, the sin sign, legisign, and qual sign, which provides us modes and context of meaning making. For example, as Juliana said, this notion of original and replications of that original as the processes of meaning making rather than one that counts and the others that are copies. I, I think there's a dynamism and some real opportunities that, that in further engagement with Peirce um, uh, offers us. And so I, one question I would have is, have you thought about sort of expanding the semiotic discourse here um, to think about representational processes and patterns? But I really want to sort of note how reading your work helps me think with this broader notion of representation across time and space in, in, in humans and our ancestors. Um, uh, the recent Neanderthal work has been absolutely fantastic. And what's really interesting is it pushes against the notion of modern or the sort of Eurocentric classical representational mode of understanding. And we think more of not primitive, right? But art as process of expression and engagement rather than a particular kind of representation that shows up specifically in temporary classic sort of art theory uh, as, as we see it. So for example, uh, you made much of the notion of the non sort of human representation of, of these potentials for transformation and dynamics well, it shouldn't surprise you at all to know that the clear, direct representation of human forms is the last form of representation to show up in the entire record of human evolution. And it remains quite rare. That is, throughout hundreds of thousands of years, the representation by humans of the world and of what they value through the sort of imaginings made material rarely takes the form of a human body and often takes the form of things in transformation, things in transition. Um, and, and so it, it struck me very strongly that the Amerindian, Amerindian motif and engagement that you're asking us to think with, right, um, is much more typical of humans across space and time than the classical representational art. And I think you even do a good job at the last portion of the book of invoking some of the medieval and challenging a little bit of this conceptualization of Imago Dei which I think resonates with much theological discourse and philosophical engagement with this, the, the, the Imago Dei as a transformational process rather than iconic representation. Mm -hmm. So I think engaging with this some semiotics is, is, is quite important. And I think you are tapping into a broader human thing with using the Amerindian ethnographic context as just a stellar example. Uh, my, my, Second point, and, and I'm going on too long already here because there's just so much to talk about. But my second point is this notion of art effects and world making, I, I think is very powerful because it, it creates this ongoing dynamic rather than a static material representation. The materials you engage are, are alive. They are in process. Um, Tim Ingold has recently said, to human is a verb. And, and I, think, I think this notion of constant movement and dynamism becomes very central and forces us away from the symbol icon index or a piece of art approach and rather to the relational nature uh, of these things. So two last things. Um, one is you don't engage it in the book, but what I see you doing is offering a bit of a push against this cognitive and psychological argument about supernatural agency detection. This argument that we have a neurocognitive tendency to associate personhood or magicalness or supernaturalness with, with, with items. And I think that's a, an incredible oversimplification and ethnographically often completely misses, right? What the groups or individuals are actually trying to convey. Uh, with those processes. So you, you, you conclude by the entire book by saying what the Amerindian archeological artifacts indicate is that faithful reproduction of natural forms is not a technical problem, 
but a conceptual one. The question is one of knowing in each case what people wish to render in visual form, right? In the case of Amerindian art, you say, um, the greatest challenge is not to depict hybrids or chimeras, but to produce images of transformation itself. And I would like to say, and let's ask you what you think about it, that this in fact is the question about human representation. This is not just limited to Amerindian, that this is actually quite broad. It's only in very recent art theory and engagement that we see these classic traditional representational contexts, whereas the vast majority of human experience is much more reflected uh, in, in the way they show us. So the issue of semiotics, is that some place you want to push further to sort of pry symbol out of people's hands and make them think a little bit more deeply with this. And, and, and second, um, I really think you have, you have a context here to allow us anthropologically and in the broader art theory world to think more effectively with the human. Thank you so much, Agustin. Fantastic. Carlos, back to you. <laughs> Thank you, Agustin. It's super difficult to answer the, all the questions in the sense they are really uh, broad. And I will, so I will start with the deep evolutionary time and the, the, the long durée that you talked about. The final part of the, 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 the conclusion and, and the use I do of archaeology, uh, I think it's not, it's not good enough now in, in, in comparing to the rest of the book. But I, I wanted to say, look, there is a long durée here, which is for me, it's not evolutionary time, it's archaeological time. Well, like, you know, I would say 15,000 years. And, and, and I'm, uh, I, I wanted to say basically that there is a tradition that, you know, it comes in, in 15,000 15, years ago to the Americas. And it was, you know, only in the 500 uh, last years that it is connected with the uh, European or Western, or how do you define it? I don't know. Uh, tradition. So that was a uh, that was this argument. I wouldn't I wouldn't dare to talk about the evolutionary time because of my ignorance of the whole. Uh, um, you know, you, you need a, some synthesis that you can go through all the the articles and have the data. Uh, to judge for yourself. It's too difficult and e e it's easy to fall into the trap of like 19th century uh, kind of reasoning about humanity and the origins without knowing enough of the empirical data. I'm, I'm really concerned with empirical data. So I, I didn't uh, uh, enter into that. In the whole discussions between, for instance, art is started as an abstract form or in figurative with the human body, I don't know, I mean, but I think it could be, if, if you think that my book resonates with these materials, that's great. I mean, it was an unintentional, but it's an art effect so, to repeat Joan's pun. <laughs> but uh, as for purse, I, I, I think it's, um, it is important to know that I, I am aware of the fact that uh, we always get a simplification of purse, which is we stayed with the icon index and symbol triad. And we don't, you never went to the other triads that derive from that ones and they were more important for purse, but they, uh, you know, that purse is a whole new world for everybody. So I have already tried, I had a student that working with purse and I tried to, but I, I was not knowledgeable enough to uh, uh, use his uh, more refined work in thinking about that. But I think it's, it's necessary. I don't know if I will do that, but I, I'm sure that someone uh, will do that and, and, and it will be great. Um, but I think that, uh, I don't know if my, my book conveys the idea that uh, you know, uh, it is a process of transformation and world making. This idea of processes uh, of never achieved uh, uh, ontological stability that you were always, you know, uh, producing new things, and and this is done in like you know uh, my argument that 
you know, you, 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 you can start by saying, you know, the pantheon is, has all these divinities and or these extraordinary beings and classify everything. Or you can see that how in the ritual, uh, how ritual actions engender a, a sort of imagetic image of powerful beings. That was I, what I tried. And I, I think we are in this, on the same page in thinking about what, what is human about these kinds of uh, creative uh, 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 production of, 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 I wouldn't say beliefs, but I would say uh, situations of possibilities, of uncertainties, that you have to think about something else to make sense of that. And this is always in the process. That was I tried to do in, the, in my analysis of the rituals. That that was I don't know if it was clear enough, but but I think yeah. Uh, Thank you, Carlos. So can I go go back with a few questions to you to you all? Then you can pick up on a few other uh, yeah. items and thoughts uh, along the road, Carlos. So so uh, we have uh, some comments and questions from the audience already uh, from Bruna Franchetto. The Amerindian philosophy of language isn't based on truth value but on a logic of uncertainty, as you mentioned, Carlos, right? And then Franchetto says, where deceit is at the heart of any speech. And that was a question I had too, you know, for you to elaborate a little bit more on that question of deceit. And I think that uh, follows some of the comments that Juliana also um, made. Um, then there's a, a question from Lucas Pratis. Uh, how do you see, Carlos, the contemporary artifacts from Amerindian peoples interacting with other societies, other groups within their, uh, the countries where they live. Um, we have witnessed more acknowledgements of indigenous artistic expressions in Latin America, for example, in recent years. Do you see those ontologies you analyze in the book being acknowledged as well? If not, what can be done? Which is another question similar to the one that Juliana put at you, you know, so, so, so there's an acknowledgement of the art, but what about, you know, the transformation of quality, the, the, the knowledge making, the uncertainty, right? How is that being uh, acknowledged or not as well? And then there is a, a, a question specifically for, uh, for Juliana, uh, throwing back that question that you asked to Carlos, uh, to you from the perspective of, of debates within museums, you know, art museums, especially uh, university art museums, you know, this, uh, this pressure and important one to decolonize, you know, museums, exhibitions, right? Which somehow, which seem to be at the, at the heart of also your question of not wanting to contain, you know, that transformational force and creative force of the mask, you know, how, how, what, what do you see um, happening? Are there certain uh, tries, trials, you know, where do you see it going beyond the critique, the, uh, the rightful critique that's taking place, you know? Um, do I start or Juliana? Maybe Juliana start and then you yeah, correct some of your so. thoughts. Yes, yes. <laughs> okay, we can duke that out. I mean, it's it's a you know it is the question of the moment um, of how do you um, decolonize a museum and its collections without decolonizing it into oblivion? How do you you know maintain the life and relevance of an of a museum without um, without a full return of of the objects to their source communities? Um, I think sort of masks are still in art museums equally in ethnographic museums, although differently treated as, in, as just static objects frozen in time and space. Um, and so the, our, the possibility for intervention is, is in a way there's a very low bar for, for potential in intervention um, because so much can be done to, um, to present these, I think, as, as, living, as living objects, as, as objects um, with, with agency um, and, and objects that are part of a, sort of a whole armature that have sort of associated paraphernalia um, in, in music and sound and dance and movement um, and change. Um, it's one of the reasons why an exhibition that I worked on focused on, on surface uh, but not just on sort of surface frozen on in time, but on the ways that surfaces change over time and are, are, are a snapshot or evidence of ongoing states of transformation and collaboration by multiple hands. Um, so I think, you know, you know, basic, you know, the basic level museums can, can do more to evoke um, sense, sense, the senses 
um, of sound and movement in the context of an exhibition or gallery installation. Um, but I think there's also another really interesting opportunity to sort of, and, and I think, um, Carlos, you really do touch on this, even though you don't speak about museums specifically, um, that, that museums can do more to sort of destabilize the gaze um, that left to their own devices, museums will inherently replicate and reinforce. Um, and I, so I think I really think it very much behooves you know, museum people um, to find ways to estrange the anthropomorphic, mimetic, figurative tradition. Um, and you know, that can be done partly by you know, adding more context and more information to the object, but it can be also maybe done in ways that maybe you were suggesting earlier, sort of radical ways, Carlos, of changing the experience of the viewer themselves, of somehow destabilizing the visitor. Um, in ways that still ensure that they return, um, you know, whether it's, you know, through certain modes of pacing, um, certain uses of light and dark, certain um, uh, withholding information, as opposed to giving excesses of information. Um, now, it, there's no one answer because the, the possible, the range of objects is so, so wide, but um, I think thinking both about presentation and about experience are necessary to really do that important work of, of decolonizing and destabilizing. Wonderful. Thank you so much. I really, really appreciate also the work you're doing here at Princeton. Deeply grateful. Thank you. Carlos? João, first, Bruna Franchetto is probably the most uh, cited uh, author in my book. She's a partner, she's a linguist and an anthropologist working among the Kwikuru uh, since the 70s. And so I, I came there later on. And, and I, most of, in, in, a, in, a, in a sense, part of my inspiration to write about tricksters among the Kwikuru, et cetera, and, and, and not language ideology, but uh, teach, touching in very sophisticated analysis, a linguistic analysis. This is due to Bruna, who guided me through this uh, uh, wonderful world of you know, uh, different words and wordings. So uh, yes, absolutely. I mean, uh, uh, that was the and and the and language here is is an essential part of this uh, the pragmatics of uh, a trickster aesthetics. So uh, and as for Lucas uh, on the contemporary indigenous artifacts and art, um, well, we are teaching a course on that. I'm still working a little bit to make sense of this. I had a student that was doing a excellent uh, uh, work on, on, on visionary painting in Peru. So, but uh, still we have, there are a lot of different Amerindian uh, uh, new forms of expression and they, they are very, uh, 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 the, 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 they are the result of very different stories uh, and histories and, and, and the way they were engaged in school, in the way they were engaged with missionaries, etc. But if you look at, for instance, Jider, the late Jider Asbel, the great uh, Makushi uh, uh, artist uh, that died recently, uh, I think his work is totally in, in synthony with my uh, theorization of Amerindian art. And it's the same for the new Sumbaniwa as well. And I would have more to say about other cases, but I, I don't wanna make it like a, you know, it fits my, my argument in general because you have different histories and you have the, the, it, 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 the appearance of figurative forms and a kind of, mimetic evocation, but with many transformations in other cases. So, and it, this has to do also with, you know, the, the visionary kind of uh, 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 painter that appears together with ayahuasca, a ritual uh, uh, taken. And, and this, so it is, it's, it's a new chapter to study. And there are also people studying that, but it's very, uh, sort of uh, varied and, and you, we have to take a look carefully on these expressions, which are fantastic. And you know, it's interesting, Carlos, right? So, and, and Juliana and Augustine, that will also generate its own different kind of art critique, if one considers, right? There's this transformational force that, uh, that comes 
through the work of, of indigenous uh, artists, but also that, you know, the anthropologist is kind of uh, uh, bringing about in artifacts, right? So Agustin, uh, there was a question for you. Um, uh, people were taken by your, by your long-term evolutionary time and framing of the transformation in terms of speaking of a, of a kind of a human becoming um, uh, and uh, like way, you know, um, ahead of the frozen of it in the in the western model monotheistic model etc so so people are also curious how how you see the the time of settler colonialism figuring in here we, we know that you think a lot about that so if you could just think about some of your take on human invention creativity art against the backdrop especially amerindian art you know, we know you're not an expert in this, but you, but you are curious, <laughs> a public scientist. You know, if you could say a little bit about how you see that unfolding against the, the backdrop of the of the temporalities of settler colonialism, and then a final set of questions uh, for Carlos. Very interesting comments and very praising comments from Elizabeth uh, Corey uh, Pierce. Mm -hmm. I was struck by the depth of your fieldwork and the use of film in your method and in sharing filmmaking skills with people you work with. Did this mutual engagement inform your understanding and your theorizing? To me, your method distinguishes um, your, your work very much from Gal's art and agency. And I think it's worth acknowledging your methodological uniqueness here. And, um, and Maria Luisa Lucas uh, Malu also asked this question about the ethnographic fieldwork for, um, for the book, which indigenous groups you interacted with and how, how do cultural and artistic differences between, um, uh, uh, between the peoples and you play a role, you know, which kind of misunderstandings, et cetera, or deceits or, you know, or, or learnings take place in the process. But it is a question about uh, your method and, and how your own artistic collaborations have influenced, you know, your own uh, theorizing here. And then a, a final question from Thiago Sa. Carlos, and then also uh, by extension also to Augustine, given you know, this, the question of the long durée evolutionary time, archeological settler colonialism uh, uh, time. Carlos, this archeological long durée of transformational imagery force that is central in your work seems to dialogue with the archeological long durée of transformational political imagination in the work of David Graeburn, for example, especially in his collaborative volume, The Dawn of Everything, a, a rare anthropological book that makes the list of, of, the, of the New York Times bestsellers, <laughs> right? Like a grand narrative, the return of a grand narrative here, uh, but not necessarily about humanity, but about political imagination, right? I wonder if you can, at this point of your work, see and point out connections or relations between imagery, meaning making, and political organizer or society making. So, so we'll start with Augustine, you collect some thoughts and then we still want to hear some final words as well from Juliana. And then we are approaching the end of this incredible, wonderful thought provoking session. Augustine. I'll respond very quickly uh, because these other questions are just fascinating. Um, I, I think what's, what's very important is to point out is to, and, and I hear Carlos does this in his book at the end there in his engagement with medieval Christian art and representation, the idea that at the point of colonization, there was a uniform Christian component is incorrect, right? Especially if we look at medieval and pre-medieval Christian art, I think we see much more motion and movement and transformational context. Um, so what we're talking about is a very specific moment, I think, at the 15th, 16th, and 17th centuries that imposed what I would say is reflected in some of what Juliana brought up about museum interpretations, that is, the horrors of colonial moment and settler colonialism stripped away the sonic sensations, the movements, the context, the dynamics and motions of many of these objects that were then extracted in a genocidal format and, and frozen in place. And so I think our interpretive landscape because of the histories of settler colonialism 
really has challenged us and, and, and made it almost impossible to actually understand these objects in the ways that Carlos is inviting us to do, right? So by reintroducing the ritual, the movement, the perceptual dynamism and the notion of transformation, I think we have a much better context. So I would argue that the, the genocidal horrors of settler colonialism have been replicated uh, in museums and in the writings and perspect the, the perspective context that have been forced not not interpreted, but forced upon these material objects. Um, yeah. And there's a lot more to say about that, but I'll, I'll shut up with this. Very but powerful. I think it's very I think poworful. And it Carlos, was, you know, Juliana was yeah. saying about the perception, right? That this yeah. the sensorial uh, training or blinding or deafening that is perpetuated there, right? Thank you, Augustine. Carlos. Yeah, thank you. Uh, Elizabeth is referring to my uh, engagements in, in in training indigenous peoples especially the Kuikuru in filmmaking and producing with them films and circulating, um, et cetera. I, I don't know exactly how it influenced my thinking about art and, and the way we, but the fact is that most of the ethnographic uh, data that is there was collected and discussed in collaboration. Um, uh, my, my detailed analysis of uh, two rituals, two Kuikuru rituals, was, is entirely dependent on the participation of the filmmakers. And, and we, we tend together to document these rituals and they would ask their own questions and I would have access to their own questions. And he, he, they would be filming difference because a ritual, big ritual like this ones that I described, you can't be in the same, in the, all the places that where action is taking place because they are taking place simultaneously. So methodologically was not possible to do that alone. And so, and, and also I have uh, uh, students of mine working together with me and with the indigenous uh, crew. And so sometimes it is uh, about the collecting, you know, really doing the hard work, but also of course, this must have influenced me in the way I came to think about these rituals. And we discussed that a lot because we had also one of the Kuikuru people that was a, a Bruno Franchetto's student at the Museo Nacional. He did a master in, in anthropology and we taught together a course on the Shingu, on the upper Shingu region, uh, et cetera. So of course it's totally ingrained, but I didn't, I didn't know how to say that. I, I, I have always thought that I would write a, a book on this project to make it clear, because for me, it's so experiential. It's so thinking as it's about intimacy and, and friendship that sometimes I forget that it's also part of the science that we do. Um, well, the ethnographic research was done in two different places in with the two different people, one or two Guarani speaking people, the Paracana, uh, were very object poor. Uh, and, and, and the other one is the, you know, the Kuikuru people from the upper Shingu, a Carib speaking people, who are very object rich. So I started the book with this cultural shock that I had when I moved from one fieldwork situation to the other. And in a sense, artifacts, originates in this culture, from this cultural shock uh, because I had to respond to a different kind of ethnographic situation and I was totally ignorant and I had to learn a lot. So that's why it took so many years to write the book. Chavo so Charles, no, like you have 30 seconds for the million dollar, the billion dollar question of artifacts and political imagination. Well, it's, it's part of the same thing, uh, Tiago. Uh, I've I've been I read David's, David's uh, book, and and I have published with uh, two colleagues of mine in 2016 an article that has a similar argument as well. One an article in 2019 with Luis Costa. So I've been kind of uh, working with this uh, with similar ideas, but at the same time different from uh, uh, the David's. For one reason, I think that is, you have to think about, uh, you know, in, in a nuanced way, the kind of people that make decisions and the ways, the different ways that human societies makes decisions. You cannot project a sort of Habermasian public space 
uh, into the past or into different regions. But this is what an ethnologist would certainly say and would never write a great narrative as, as big as that because you, you, we started to nuance everything and see differences and it would be like a 15,000 pages book to do this. So it's, it's not their fault. It's just a difference of you know, perspectives. Okay. But so I think- Augustine, do you want to, to add some final you know, comment and Juliana? I mean, I'll, I'll just say say quickly as as a as by by way of thanking you. Um, I just wanted to say how much I appreciated your sort of intensely interrogative approach to writing about artifacts, where you made these arguments in the form of of multiple nested inquiries um, in a way that I felt exempl itself exemplified the sort of serious play that you study um, and, and where you sort of give as gifts to the reader, um, including readers well outside of your fields like myself, the ethnographic and linguistic tools to interrogate ritual images. So I just wanted to thank you um, for, for the gift of, of that sort of interrogative approach. And, and I'll just, I'll echo the exact same thing, the depth and the clarity with which you convey, not just the ethnographic sense, but the dynamism, the transformational processes of, of the core content that you're relating, I think was very powerful. And it again shows us the, the, the rationale behind deep ethnography and engagement with the communities, rather than sort of an imposition of interpretation on the communities. And, and I, I think you did a wonderful job with that. And, and I very much appreciate it. Okay. So here it is, artifacts. Thank you, Juliana. Thank you, Augustine, right? So Carlos, you know, we love your work, your incredible work. We love you and we are so happy to have you as a partner collaborator on, on, on so many things and more things to come. And uh, Carlos, so like, um, you know, really uh, warm congratulations for this amazing feat that you produced together with, uh, with these wonderful people that you have been working with for, for decades now, really, it's, uh, it's, uh, it's, 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 it's very powerful. And uh, we look forward to continue learning from you and from the peoples that you work with. So, so for our viewers, thank you so much for watching. We hope you will be here with us for future Brazil Lab events. So please subscribe to our YouTube channel and find us on Instagram and Twitter. So again, Carlos, Augustine, Juliana, muito obrigado. Gracias, uh, thank you. Stay well all and see you all soon. Take good care.